Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'm calling this meeting to the first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Yes, good afternoon. I uh, wanted to announce first off um, an agenda uh, change for today's meeting. Um, and right now, and I just had the page up and now I don't, but I think I can recall from memory, we're, we're just switching essentially the two items that are on the agenda. We're gonna have the vital budget guidance go first and then the total cost of care discussion go second. And I wanted to announce that to the board and to the public. Any questions on that? And Mike will let me know if I have to do anything else. Um, the other two announcements I have is, uh, first, our April board meeting schedule has been posted to our website. So that is under our meeting schedule and right under the header is a link to that April press release. Please keep an eye on that. Um, there will be uh, potentially some changes as we go along through the month, some additions and, and potential changes, but that is a good guide as to what we'll be doing for the next month. And then last but certainly not least, we do have an ongoing public comment regarding uh, the next and uh, potential next model with CMMI, CMS, uh, all payer model. Um, that information is located on our website under ongoing special comment periods. There are slides that uh, our team, as well as the Director of Healthcare Reform for the Agency of Human Services, presented to our General Advisory Committee and, a permit, and our Primary Care Advisory Committee. Um, we're opening this up for the general public to comment at any time, but as a reminder, we are expecting comments back from the General Advisory Committee in writing by April 1st. And when we get those comments, we will share those with our partners at AHS and at the administration as they'll be leading the way on the potential next agreement. And that is all I have to announce. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 24th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 24th without any additions, deletions, or, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. At this point in time in the meeting, I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over to Sarah Kensler for a discussion on the vital budget guidance. Sarah. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can folks see the um, the draft budget guidance document at this point? Yes. Excellent. All right. Um, thank you. So for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Strategy and Operations at the board. Um, I'm here today to present a draft annual budget guidance for the board's review um, of Vermont Information Technology Leaders budget um, or VITAL. Um, the goals of the draft guidance, there's an echo that I'm hearing. I don't know if others are hearing that as well. I think it is gone now. All right. Um, so the goals of the draft guidance are to provide clarity to the board and to vital about the regulatory timeline of the board's um, vital budget review and the contents of the budget packet, um, as well as clarity around monitoring activities, including quarterly updates and a mid-year budget update. And I, I should have started this by saying um, the board has been reviewing Vital's budget only for a few years now, since I think 2016. Um, and so um, it's it's been historically a slightly less structured review than some of our other um, than some of our other regulatory processes. Um, and and in in seeking to introduce some guidance into the space, um, I think it will um, it'll add clarity on a on a variety of levels. So in addition to clarity around the the kind of budget review timeline and the contents of the budget packet. 
um, we, we'd like to introduce some more clarity around monitoring activities, including quarterly updates and a mid-year budget update. Um, these have been included in the board's decisions for the past few years, um, but detailing the kind of consistent elements in guidance um, ensures a more consistent schedule on contents. Uh, in addition, it will support collaboration between the board staff, uh, DIVA and VITAL in the budget development stage so that we can anticipate potential budget changes in that mid-year update um, and to better document the process, contents and timing of the mid-year submission. Um, as a reminder for board members, um, VITAL's fiscal year be begins on July 1st when their contract year with DIVA and the bulk of their revenue begins uh, on January 1st. Um, this disconnect has meant that over the past couple of years, um, we've had a need to do budget adjustments or mid-year forecasts once that DIVA contract was signed. Um, and our hope is that by putting some, um, some, some more structure around uh, the mid-year update and around the kind of how we deal with that disconnect um, will help uh, ease that process. Um, in addition, uh, finally, it will clarify the board's um, principles for review, which haven't been updated since we took on uh, vital budget review in 2016. Um, so before we jump in, I just want to note that this guidance is meant to be non-year specific, so it won't need to be re-reviewed and approved by the board each year unless there's something that needs to change. Um, to that end, there are some pieces that uh, are left to staff to specify or left to the board's budget order to specify to allow us for, for some flexibility year to year if something's kind of not working um, as it should. Um, all right. So moving on to the second page, um, we're in the introduction now. Um, here we include the statutory language uh, as well as uh, the principles for the budget review um, that the board uses in making its decision. Um, these are adapted very, very lightly from the existing criteria, which I'll just toggle over to from a second for, for one second. These are from uh, the 2019 staff presentation. Um, uh, and it, they are uh, almost identical, um, reorganized a tiny bit. Um, I just want to note that what we did do is remove um, review of vital score activities um, from these principles, um, which had been removed from our statute in Act 187 of 2018. Um, so next we'll move on to part A on page three, um, and this is really the meat of the actual submission, but you'll see that um, that theme kind of continues of, um, you know, we're, we're not making too many huge changes here. Um, it's more that we're kind of codifying our previous practice. Um, so here we get into the meat of the actual submission and part A covers uh, the budget submission itself. Um, the vast majority in line with what VITAL has submitted in past years um, it, through kind of the informal guidance process. Um, section one is uh, the budget narrative. Um, and there are a couple of changes that I'm proposing here. Um, the first is in the key work stream section. Um, uh, and then uh, there are a few changes to, again, try to, to, to get at that better estimate of the DIVA contract at the start of the budget year. So in key work streams, um, I just wanna highlight that um, number two here um, uh, requires submission of two tables or two submissions with, uh, with a format to be specified by staff. Um, the first is new, but it will help us um, get a better link between the vital budget uh, and the HIT plan by using the same framework that uh, the HIT plan uses to look at the, the technical architecture um, and kind of like the different components of the health information exchange, um, which, which is the ONC's conceptual IT services model, also known as the stack diagram. Um, that second table um, digs more deeply into a few key areas and links spending with metrics and that's something that was submitted to us last year and something that um, board members and staff found helpful. So we we would like to keep that for the long term. Um, uh, and I've included draft templates for both of these tables at the end of this document to kind of give us an idea um, of what we're hoping that VITAL will submit. And this is probably the, the format that I would, uh, as a staff, specify this year. And then we could, you know, see if it, if it wasn't quite working, we could make some tweaks if we needed to. But I've included draft templates for both of those um, tables at the end of the draft guidance. Um, now scrolling us back up. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight here is under um, proposed FY budget uh, bullet C here. Um, the, the first and third sub bullets here um, are both aimed at getting us to a place where there's less variance between the approved budget 
um, and the final revenue from the DIPA contract um, for the coming calendar year, um, noting that the past few years have been exceptional uh, due to you know, anticipated changes in federal HIT funding and due to COVID. Um, we're also asking about other anticipated revenue here, which will tell us a little bit more about what VITAL expects from other contracts that might be signed um, mid, mid fiscal year. Um, but hope, we're hoping that this will get us to a place where we don't need that mid-year budget update as much because the, the, what we've been told to anticipate in the budget and what, is, um, what comes to, to be in the contract are, um, are very similar um, or kind of within a, within a certain variance. Um, section two is the actual budget submission um, and nothing there, uh, nothing significant has changed there. Um, same goes for sections three, four, and five. Um, I do wanna note that section four um, pertains only to VITAL's uh, revenue, not to its contracts with its vendors, um, which we do not receive. Um, so that is all, that, that's the budget submission. Um, next, I'm gonna move on to part B, um, which is the, rec the reporting requirements. Um, this lays out some kind of more detail than we've previously included uh, in, um, uh, in, in the budget order conditions. Um, so it'll give us a little bit more detail and clarity before the start of the budget year about what we're, what we're anticipating and we'll give vital more clarity there as well. Um, the changes here that I wanna highlight for board members uh, and the public are that um, for the past few years, we've required um, quarterly presentations to the board from vital um, that have included um, both report outs on specific projects as well as kind of a set of quarterly metrics that are the, the same over time um, that give us kind of a, a look into VITAL's performance on various things, including, you know, interfaces, including how many um, alerts have been sent over their systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, rather than requiring VITAL to come in four times a year, which has been hard to achieve practically just due to all our various schedules, um, this draft guidance proposes to require presentations twice a year with brief written submissions each quarter. Um, these will include this, that same data that the board's been receiving quarterly in the past, plus highlights from key projects that are named in the budget order. Again, that's a spot where we left some flexibility to change things annually, um, since there will likely be you know, new and different projects that the board uh, would like updates on each year. Um, my understanding from VITAL is that these quarterly updates are fairly low burden and that this would not be a challenge uh, for them to kind of switch to a written update um, versus an in-person update. Um, my guess is that those in-person updates twice a year would likely naturally fall to, to be around VITAL's budget presentation, which happens in May or June, um, and to the mid-year budget update, which happens in, um, in you know, midwinter. Um, Speaking of that mid-year budget update, uh, the, the mid-year budget updates are a relatively new phenomenon driven by that disconnect in the timing between the fiscal year and the terms of VITAL's contract, contract with DIVA. Um, and this has been the case since 2019 only. Um, so that said, the guidance is working to push us toward more reliable estimates, which would decrease the, the difference between um, the, what, what is anticipated for the contract in the budget and the actual terms of the contract. Um, so our so what I've laid out here in the draft guidance is uh, an option with kind of two paths. If um, if the budget exceeds a certain variance, we'll get a, a more significant uh, mid-year forecast. Um, if the variance does not exceed a certain threshold, then then we'll get you know a year-to-date financials. Um, and then again, if requested, we can always um, you know require Vital to present that mid-year update to the board at a public meeting. Um, so that is the, the complete guidance right there. Um, happy to talk about questions. Okay, questions from the board? Are there any questions from the board? Um, I don't have questions, but I did just want to comment on a couple of things. I, I do think it makes sense to talk about, um, you know, really seeing them, you know, twice a year versus four times a year. I mean, um, you know, we really just have a review of their budgets. And when we look at some of the other processes we have, like the hospital budgets, we don't even see the hospitals in a public format. You know, typically we don't see them four times a year. So it, so it seems, and, and I know scheduling and things like that also, you know, play a role. So I think that makes sense. And I also think, 
you know, looking at a, a variance, I know there's a disconnect between when they get their contract signed um, and, you know, 500,000 or 5%, um, I think is is more than reasonable. Um, you know, even if we had gone a little higher, I, I think that would be okay too, but let's see how this goes, uh, you know, because we all, all know, you know, a budget, we're gonna have variances to budget. So 5% isn't even that much of a swing. So, um, so I think it's good to put some parameters on there and down the road, maybe even there's room to go more if we wanted to, but, um, you know, great, great way to kind of rein this all in and, and kind of formalize the process more. So thanks. Other questions from the board? I don't have a question, but I do agree with Maureen's comments and Sarah, I think you did a great job uh, pulling this together. Sarah, what, it, what would be the next steps? Um, the next step is uh, public comment period. Um, this will get posted this afternoon for public comment uh, on the public comment page of our website, um, and then we can um, we can hold a, a you know a potential vote if the board is ready um, on the fourteenth. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I don't have a question either. I've uh, <clears throat> read this and reviewed it the other day with Sarah and. Uh, I think it's definitely moving in the right direction in terms of uh, making the process more integrated uh, from a contract point of view and a uh, fiscal year point of view. And uh, also, I think the three to five project uh, streams presentations give uh, the viewer a kind of a more visceral understanding of what some of this technological lingo uh, might, might be leading to. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I think Sarah's done a great job as well as the folks at Vital that she's working with. And I, I, from my point of view, it's good to go. Any other comments from the board? If not, we'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment? Seeing and hearing none, thank you, Sarah. Um, as usual, a concise presentation. And uh, again, the public comment will be open up and we'll come back to this on the 14th. Thank you all very much. So with that, we're gonna move on to um, a discussion on the all payer ACO uh, model uh, update on quality and total cost of care. And for that, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Michelle Degree and Lindsay Kill. Whenever the two of you are ready. It helps to unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Michelle Degree. Um, I'm joined by Lindsay Kill. I'm just getting our slides ready here for presentation. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, just confirming everyone can see that. All right, um, so uh, Lindsay and I are here today to talk to you about the 2019 final results for total cost of care and quality. Um, we'll do a brief update on, or an overview on scale, um, but the main focus of this is to um, again, just do the, the final year end for 2019. I know it's hard when we're already in 2021. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, we're talking about performance year two of the agreement, um, and which again, we're in PY4, so I know it gets confusing, but trying to think back to 2019. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you, Michelle. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Kill. I work on the analytics team and today I'm gonna talk with to everyone about the financial updates. And we're actually going to start by level setting with revisiting the discussion on scale. A few of these slides, including slide three in front of you now, are repeats from what we went over in December for that presentation. Um, but I think it's helpful to discuss scale before we get into numbers. So when we talk about scale, 
what we're talking about is the eligible population to be measured within the all-payer model agreement. And specifically in our reporting on slide three here, what we're showing is the actual proportion of members aligned with the ACO at the point in time that we're discussing, performance year two, 2019. So the way to read this is that in 2019, the proportion of the population enrolled with the ACO as, as the subset of the total cost of care is 47%. The target was 75%, but 47% is the blended total across all payers. Slide four, please. Thank you. So on slide four, what I've done is I've broken out that blended scale number of 47% into the payers that are participating. In green, we have Medicare. In blue, we have Medicaid. In a darker green, we're showing commercial fully insured. And then separately in a deep blue, I'm showing commercial other. And under other commercial is commercial self-funded and Medicare Advantage. And I did that because actually, as we show the proportion of scale for people for those groups who are aligned with the ACO. Uh, Medicare Advantage is not aligned with the ACO at this time. And so it was just, it was a, a highlight on zero. And I, we thought that that was a little hard to read. So we, we grouped them, but it's important to note here that there's no Medicare Advantage alignment with the ACO in this model year. We can see here that there's growth from in Medicaid and Medicare and commercial, both fully insured and other, um, there's some growth, but not a ton in uh, between 2018 and 2019. And so we wanted to demonstrate, we wanted to talk about that first to really harken back to what proportion of the population we are talking about in these total cost of care results. Um, Slide five, great. So just a couple more notes on scale. Uh, you have another report coming out in June, 2021 that will include final numbers for 2020 and the uh, projected 2021. Projected 2022 will be available when we receive One Care's 2022 budget based on the contract negotiations at that point in time. So we don't have those right now. Additional changes to keep in mind in the background of all of this, because um, the total cost of care is, is really everyone in vCures, and then as a subset of that, it's those aligned with the ACO. So kind of balancing these two populations in our mind, but the Vermont State Employees Association, or VSEA, was added to the scale qualifying population recently, and that's included in the proposed 2021 budget. So that's gonna be a change to our scale numbers. And then also, going back to Medicare Advantage, over time, more Vermonters are opting for Medicare Advantage. Since Medicare Advantage is considered a commercial payer in this model, we're really seeing that potential scale taken from Medicare growth and moved into commercial. And since they are not currently aligned with the ACO, uh, the state is discussing ways to include them in the future in the model. But as Michelle said, where we are in 2019 with these results, MA is, is under, would show up under commercial non-ACO. Slide six, please. Or slide seven. So now we're going to get into financial results. Again, we're in performance year two, 2019. And as of this year, 2019, we have three years of Medicaid data in the model, and we have two years for Medicare and commercial participation in the model. And then on slide eight, thank you. Here we're comparing expenditures in millions really just to see where the all-payer model total cost of care fits in the overall discussion of Vermont medical spend on behalf of Vermonters. This slide should be familiar to us from the December presentation, but we thought it was a good one, so we re-included it. So for 2019, from our expenditure analysis estimate, we 
we believe that we'll land somewhere at or above 6.4, roughly 6.4 billion for total Vermont resident spend. A subset of that, approximately 46%, is what is captured in the all-payer model total cost of care in terms of total spend on behalf of Vermont residents. And then a subset of that even, and 14% of the total spend, is the 881 million captured in One Care Vermont's own total cost of care budget, or not budget, excuse me, 2019 in um, final numbers that they showed in their 2021 budget. Got it. And I have citations underneath for all of those. Uh, on slide nine, please. Here on slide nine, we're just diving a little bit more into, since the all-payer model total cost of care only captures that 46%, well, what is that other 54%? What, what are those services and those people that we're talking about who are not included? This is really a result of trying to align all of the different payer plans, so making Medicaid and commercial align more with what it is that Medicare covers. And so we are, so in that 54% of expenses not included in the all payer model, we're seeing retail pharmacy, dental expenses, behavioral health and substance abuse expenses. And then there's some of these different populations like Medicare Advantage, federal employee plans, workman's comp, et cetera. Slide 10, thank you. Here, we're showing, again, trying to combine this perspective on scale with the perspective of the proportion of spend that we're seeing in the total cost of care. There's that total nearly $3 billion figure, and we can see that of that total, Medicare comes in the highest. They have 44% of the expenditures in the total cost of care, all, despite um, representing 27% in terms of member months. Medicaid comes in the lowest for total cost of care expenditure proportion, but is around Medicare's proportion of member months. And commercial is fairly even. Commercial is 42% of the total cost of care and 45% of the member months. And I really like this graphic because I think it shows how varied it is. So slide 11, we get to the answer of the best question, how did we do in 2019? Between 2017 and 2019, what did the total cost of care, how, how much was that total cost of care change on behalf of Vermont residents? And the, the answer is 4.6%. And it's important to note that while we monitor year-over-year -year change, Vermont's performance is really assessed from 2017 to date with the focus on the outcome at the end of the performance period, which is performance year five or 2022. And slide 12, thank you. Here's a little bit more detail about the breakouts by payer that contribute to that total 4.6 compounded annualized growth. And I've also included from the Na national health expenditures numbers, the growth between 2017 and 2018, which is growth performance year zero to performance year one, and then 2018 and 2019. So growth between performance year one and performance year two. We had those national estimates from their data that was released not too long ago. So we're showing 4.7 and 4.5. Those are just benchmarks they include much more than claims, so, um, but we thought it was good to show that. And the all-payer model, specifically the 2019 file, final numbers is $549 per member per month with the 5.2% growth from last year. And by payer, when, when you look across the different payer groups, we can see that there's some there, there's growth concentrated in commercial. I do just want to give a disclaimer. I'm going to talk a little bit about 
more about commercial numbers on the next slide, but it's important when we think about scale and we think about how our scale, both in and outside of the ACO is changing over time, that until scale is stable, it's tough to compare these numbers between uh, year over year. Um, but we do, we did just want to include all of them on this slide because these are the numbers that go into that calculation of the compounded annual growth, which we're all looking at. Slide 13, please. Thank you. Slide 13 is yet more detail into what was included on slide 12. This breaks out the all payer and per payer total cost of care per member per month based on ACO enrollment versus non-ACO enrollment. Before I go into a little bit more detail on those results, I do want to add that there's currently work on, that we're undergoing with um, NPR on looking at cost drivers in and out of the ACO. So really to provide more detail into all of this, what we're seeing. But what we can say on this slide I spoke before about commercial, that 7.5% between 2018 and 2019. This is really the highest area of growth and, and is driving that 5.2%. What's notable is that the ACO commercial group, where there was 10.6% of growth, is actually um, it's a fairly small population. It's only about 30,000 people in Vermont. The largest contributor actually is the non-ACO commercial group. This is 6.9% growth year over year or 3.9% compounded annual growth. And that group is more like 250,000 people. And within that group is Medicare Advantage, who, as we said before, is at the time not participating in the ACO. And so they have quite a lot of the spend growth attributed to them and their plans. So, and again, more detail coming on all of that, comparing in and out of the ACO through this work that is currently in progress. So slide 14, please. Thank you. So after looking at the finances, we thought it would be a good idea to take a step back and look at a very high level where the state's influence is and over what groups in the total cost of care. And so what I've done here is grouped all of the enrollment groups that you saw from slide 12 and 13 into whether there is some state regulatory control versus no state regulatory control. And when I grouped those that way, we have under some state regulatory control, we have Medicaid, ACO and non-ACO aligned, Medicare, ACO aligned, and commercial fully insured, who are all under some state regulatory control. Where there's no regulatory control is Medicare non-ACO aligned, Medicare Advantage, and the majority of commercial self-funded. And so on slide 15, I just want to show kind of an interesting perspective. If we take from the total cost of care annual, final annual numbers, if we sum the total dollars across all of these groups for which there's some regulatory control, and we sum all of their member months, so the proportion of market penetration, we can actually see that the, the ACO within the all-payer model has allowed us to bring more control, more dollars under, under some regulatory control, and more uh, insurance market penetration under some regulatory control, which I thought was a really interesting perspective. And so that's what we're seeing here. And slide 16, great, thank you. So these are just the key takeaways. Again, majority of performance year one to performance year two growth is from commercial. The emphasis is really on the Medicare Advantage population. They were not participating in the ACO during this period, 2018 
2019. So there's less ability to control these costs. There was some growth we saw in the commercial fully insured population. That was that 10.6% between 2018 and 2019. That is really from the Blue Cross Blue Shield risk pool change and also their rates increased in that time. So that's really what we're seeing. There is growth, of course, in the other payers, and a lot of that is reflected through the change in demographics as people in Vermont age into Medicare and Medicare Advantage populations. And as I mentioned before, more people electing for Medicare Advantage coverage instead of traditional Medicare. But overall, the model has brought more of Vermont's healthcare system-wide spend back into state regulatory control, which is... Um, can be a good thing, depending on, you know, what we think about how we might affect some of those costs. And then slide 17, looking ahead, we are anticipating more detail on utilization and costs for ACO aligned versus non ACO aligned members. And that's current work. And as soon as we have those results, we're excited to share them. We are expecting utilization to be lower in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so for this reason, although the 4.6% is higher than that upper bound 4.3%, we're not expecting a triggering event. And lastly, just a reminder that on April 14th, AHS will be presenting to the board on the all pair model improvement plan for considerations for next steps. And that concludes my share of the slides. I'm going to hand it off to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, all right. So now we're going to jump into the 2019 uh, quality and population health outcomes portion. Um, before I dive into the good stuff, uh, I just want to talk about a couple of considerations that we need to keep in mind when reviewing these results. Um, and some of these are semi redundant to what you heard from Lindsay. But um, so, you know, as with the 2018 uh, population uh, quality report, all of the data presented here are based on the mutual understanding of the technical changes amendment that was in progress at the beginning of 2020. As you'll recall, we were going through a process with CMMI um, to make some technical changes to the agreement that was put on pause due to the public health emergency. Um, so this report is also uh, produced kind of based on that mutual understanding and agreement that we had come to before that process was um, halted. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of things. So public health emergency first, um, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this report um, does not provide an update on all measures. We're missing two. Um, for those two measures that are missing, uh, they require some level of the health department's involvement and analysis. And since the health department has been um, sort of on the front lines of the pandemic and switching their uh, priorities to focus on um, the response, the, there's a couple of measures missing, and once we're able to get that from them, we will update the report and update the board um, on those results. But for now, they just remain uh, not included here. Um, Lindsay touched on scale a little bit, so I want to talk about it in, in terms of its impact on the quality results. So while model performance on quality metrics is obviously of utmost importance, it's also important to note the underlying denominator changes in many measures specific to the ACO aligned population. So when more Vermonters enter skilled target qualifying programs, it's going to introduce volatility in our ability to compare data from year to year. Um, as we know, once attribu attribution sort of starts to plateau, it'll be easier to draw conclusions on aligned beneficiary health and quality over time. Um, these sort of increases in scale, coupled with the fact that trending is not super advised uh, with only two years of data, I just want to caution folks uh, in their interpretation of results at this kind of early juncture. And as you can see on the slide, there was a 46% growth in scale um, in both the all payer and Medicare population. So the denominator for these measures went up between 2018 and 2019 by 46%. Um, and risk, uh, 
Uh, so risk scores, um, as we learned from our peer differential reporting, um, they're a way to compare populations based on healthcare utilization and predict future utilization patterns. Um, and from that peer differential report, we know that ACO aligned members have about a 2% higher risk overall than uh, the remaining population in VCRs. So with that, let's dive in. Um, a couple of level setting things as we go through these slides. Uh, the, the arrows are meant to be helpful, but I have learned in many conversations tend to cause confusion. So I'll tell you what I meant by them. And if you decide that you want me to take them out, I will. <laughs> um, so the direction of the arrow is the change from last year, whether it went up or down. And the color is supposed to help us indicate um, kind of the, the movement towards our performance year five goal. So if caution should be exercised or if there's you know a super big area of concern here. Um, so talking about population level health outcomes targets, as you can see from this slide, there's one that we've indicated as sort of a cause for concern, and that is the percent of adults with a personal care doctor or provider. Um, the rate has decreased in the base year, which is at 87% in 2017, uh, and it's now at 86%, which has remained the same uh, across 2018 and 2019. Um, the goal for PY5 is to get us to 89%, so obviously a decrease is not making that any easier. Um, I think, you know, this is just an area that we want to look out for and continue to monitor. I know um, while I wasn't here at the time of the negotiations, the rate itself for the target was based on the highest performing state at the time, which was Massachusetts. Um, and so it's just something we're going to continue to monitor based on these behavioral risk factor surveillance system results. So these come from the breakfast survey, which is administered through VDH and the CDC. Um, we'll continue to monitor sort of the highest performing states to see if that level might also be dropping. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, another piece that I'd like to point out is, so the first measure listed here, the deaths related to drug overdose, um, well, I was able to receive the 2019 rate for the measure as it is specified in the agreement. Um, the health department actually is moving away from reporting in this manner, so the all drug overdose death, um, and is moving more specifically to an opioid related measure. Um, and so I have uh, put in the written text of the um, report and also will be working with CMMI to see um, if the updated measure that they're now reporting is a viable substitute, just recognizing that you know if it's something they're regularly reporting and updating, we don't we don't want to have duplicate work or additional work if there's a measure that we can use in its place. So just to flag that as well, that that could potentially change in the future, um, but is something that they would be able to provide trend data on. So it's not like we would lose um, ground. With that, I will go to healthcare delivery system quality targets. Um, so the gray shaded cells here is an example of one of the measures that are missing from our data. Um, so here, I think it's important to sort of note the, the promising results. A lot of the measures on this page are among ACO aligned um, beneficiaries. Um, the, the one, area of concern that we've noted there um, is the 30-day follow-up after discharge from the emergency department for alcohol or other drug dependence. Ooh, try saying that one 10 times fast. Um, so the denominator here, the eligible population for this measure um, increased by 58% over 2018. So when you look at the 2018 report and you see the denominator there, um, it's, a, it's much smaller. Um, and so just thinking through that as we as we start to interpret these results, again, sort of giving some caution to that with the, the large increase in scale between performance years one and two, this is a good example of that. Um, I think there's been some really great improvement in other measures um, for the ACO line population, and I'm hopeful that we can take some learnings from there and apply it to this 
um, the alcohol and other drug dependence um, follow up. Um, there's also some confusion on this page around um, this diabetes measure here. Um, as you can see, the 2018 rate and the 2019 rate are drastically different, though they fall within the same percentile range. Uh, and that is due to a um, decision at the federal level. So the 2018 number that you see is actually um, used to be a composite measure. It was this measure coupled with a diabetic eye exam. Uh, at the federal level that was disaggregated starting in 2019. So moving forward, we will have simply the HbA1c hemoglobin A1c for control measure, um, but that will not change the 2018 rate at this time. Um, and again, because we're working on um, falling within a, a national Medicare benchmark range, this kind of still still works, um, and we are within that range at this time. Third and final, the process milestones. Um, again, here we see some grade cells. So the Vermont prescription monitoring system data are currently unavailable. Um, with that, though, you'll see in the written report that uh, the health department has begun reporting on morphine milligram equivalents per 100 residents. Um, and again, I'm working with CMMI to see if this measure could be an acceptable substitute over time given that it is now in their sort of recurring measures that they're producing and um, publicly reporting um, and do have historical data on that measure as well. So potentially a change here um, still to be determined, but um, anything that we can sort of uh, avoid um, asking too much of our, our health department partners, especially as the pandemic continues, I think is really important. Um, and just to point out here, a, a really positive trend that we're seeing, uh, the Medicare Adolescent Welfare Visit, Medicaid Adolescent Welfare Visit, excuse me, um, we're seeing a steady increase and in that current trajectory that we're seeing is setting us up for some promising growth by performance year five. Um, given the public health emergency though, I will point out that GMCB along with everyone in the state and across the nation um, are going to be monitoring rulemaking and any measure changes and that this kind of goes for all the measures that we're talking about here, but this one specifically um, to account for any telehealth utilization and changes that may come to national measure sets based on the public health emergency. And, you know, should there be um, any changes to future versions of this report? Um, this is a HEDIS measure. So if HEDIS were to update for their 2020 plan year, we would want to make sure to reflect that as well. Um, and the question then becomes, you know, would it be something that you would have to backdate to 2018 and 2019 results, or would it simply just be a change in methodology that began in 2020? So again, all of that to be determined. All that to say, <laughs> we are currently on track to meet five out of six of our population level health outcomes targets. Seven out of eight available healthcare delivery system quality targets, again, that one being unavailable, and five out of the six process milestones, again, with one of those unavailable. I will say, just given our, our current state, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with our 2019 results, um, and of course, have some caution as to how may we might be able to interpret results for the life of the agreement as we move forward, just recognizing what the pandemic has done um, across the board for data collection and uh, interpretation. So as I've uh, stated several times now, we're, we will continue to monitor and consult with our federal and state partners to ensure accurate data reporting um, and to reflect any measure changes at any level. So looking ahead, Lindsay talked about a couple of these earlier, but um, we're looking at a comparative analysis for um, our across performance years one and two of our continuously enrolled ACO beneficiaries. So those who were enrolled for at least 11 months in their, their group um, and were part of the ACO. So looking at their sort of um, trying to track those folks over time as they move through the years of the agreement. Uh, and as Lindsay stated, we're also working uh, to better understand the model's impact on access and utilization services 
Um, and, you know, more specifically looking at inpatient, outpatient, and primary care um, cost drivers. Just to round it out, uh, upcoming all-pair model reporting this year. So the 2019 annual TCOC report will be released uh, as soon as we can get it. <laughs> uh, we have been working uh, on this one quite nonstop for the past few weeks now. We got a couple of um, new data points that needed to be incorporated and they did make it into this presentation, but they need to be reflected in the report as well. Um, and so just making sure that we have all of the most accurate information in there before that's published publicly. Um, then following that, as Lindsay stated, we've got our scale targets and alignment report for 2020, and that will be coming out in June. We have another annual pair differential report, um, which will be a 2020, so it'll assess the pair differential between 2019 and 2020. And then at the end of this year, um, in concert with AHS, is the proposal for the subsequent agreement. So as Lindsay said, they're coming in to present on the all pair model improvement plan in a couple of weeks. Um, and I would imagine shortly after that, we would start to hear um, a little more about the planning process for that proposal. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, Michelle. I'll kick off the first question, Michelle. Um, you know, obviously this data is a point in time and that point in time is 2019. Do you have concerns about uh, um, the fact that uh, the health department has seen an uptick in um, the number of uh, ODs during the pandemic? Yeah, that's a... Uh, an unfortunate but really good question. So um, we've heard sort of a lot about that. Um, there was a lot of conversation about it sort of last summer when it, you know, when we had the first sort of, it's not really a lull, but lull in the pandemic and started really reviewing some of those data details. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of it is due to fear of accessing emergency services. Um, so I think continuing to work with the health department and um, their tracking and monitoring and seeing um, what else can be done, but it is absolutely a concern in terms of model performance, but as a human, you know, just in terms of overall health and well-being of Vermonters. Okay, I'll open it up to the board for questions or comments. Board? I have a question on Lindsay. I just wanted to make sure that I understood um, the way that you talked about the slide. I'm sorry, I didn't note the number that has the expenditure analysis, the total cost of care. There you go. Uh, the next nine, I think it is. Perfect. So um, when you were talking about the types of expenses that were not included, um, the the box that's under APM total cost of care, some of those things are in the total cost of care, but they're not in the one care total, right? So for example, the total cost of care is based on physician and hospital services um, with some exclusions for uh, groups that aren't included in VCARES. But for example, Medicare Advantage is included in the total cost of care, but it is not included in the one care uh, right. Box. Yeah. That's right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to make sure I understood that because it was a little confusing to me. Um, and so I just wanted to clear that up. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also just ask about um, slide 14. Yeah. So um, this is probably lawyer picky, <laughs> so forgive me. <laughs> okay. But when, when you use the term regulatory, you are using that term to be inclusive of contractual agreements. So for example, uh, Medicaid doesn't regulate the ACO, but they do have a contract through which they influence the ACO program. Yeah, I think we were, when we came up with this, high level look, we were really thinking about the areas in which um, and there's any entity it, at the state 
that has some regulatory control over these payers. So Medicaid is um, that there is some state right. level. They set control. the policy, right. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's what I, the way I thought you were using that term, but yeah. um, it's a little bit broader than how I would use it as a lawyer. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think then you could also include, um, this wouldn't apply obviously to 2019, but in the future, um, there is some state control over, for example, state employees and education yeah. employees. Yeah, um, we were thinking that um, I almost put like an asterisk on this slide for the state employees and for the teachers union for that reason. Um, yeah, in terms of the self-funded groups. But that is, I think for this high level perspective, we were just hoping to kind of yeah, keep keep it high level for now. But if this is an area of inquiry and of categorization that you all are interested in, then I think we could do more detail in the future. Cool. Yeah, no, I thought it was an interesting look and I appreciated slide 15 as well, um, uh, kind of illustrating uh, that point. So thank you for that. And then... Um, can we go to slide 16? Um, so one piece that I just wanted to circle back to, um, just to make sure it's fully clear, is so what happened in this year is that Blue Cross Blue Shield lost market share to MVP. Mm -hmm. MVP was not participating in the ACO. So that basically meant that uh, Blue Cross, you had one carrier in, one carrier out. Yeah. And um, as a result of that market shift, uh, Blue Crosses, as you noted, risk pool changed um, significantly. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think the other piece of it that was, that I just wanted to point out is that MVP wasn't participating mm -hmm. at that point, although now they are. So, yeah, just to um, round out that story. Um, maybe we can, um, if you'd like, we could update the slides and I could put that um, either as an asterisk or maybe in parentheses there, like which one is in and which one is out at that point. Um, Cause I do think that's a good point. Thank you. Um, and that, those are really the areas that I just wanted to clarify and make sure I was thinking about it holistically. So, and thank you very much to both of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, other members of the board? Well, maybe yeah, I'll just jump one. in. Oh, go ahead, Maureen. No, you go ahead. Um, I'm just going to build a little bit on Robin's last point about um, Blue Cross Blue Shield being in in that year, MVP being out in that year, um, and the risk, underlying risk of those populations being quite different will definitely contribute to our understanding of the commercial, um, the ACO and the non-ACO spend within the commercial population for that year. And I'm sure this is something that Mathematica is doing in their report. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, emphasize that we need to understand the risk pools there, um, and you know, the demographics and all of that of the different populations. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that report. I'm actually the, one of my questions was, when is that report or that analysis coming out? It'll be a little while. Um, the ad hoc request was just approved um, through, so Mathematica also has a subcontractor, so it just made it through that approval process um, a couple of weeks ago, so it'll it'll take some time. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, is that summer, fall, winter? That's I'm I would imagine to get summer, that. yeah, I would not. Oh, okay. I don't, Got it, I don't I'm just trying to get a rough kick estimate. myself here for saying that, but I would imagine that, yes, it would be available in the summer, um, that's pending, you know, what the board uh, wants to dig into a little deeper once we get our initial run at the data. Got it. Um, my second question, Michelle, was um, about the, you know, given the importance of the primary care providers, uh, having access to a primary care provider and all the emphasis that we're trying to put on primary prevention and all of that, you know, that, you know, your, your red arrow there of, you know, 86% with a target of 89%. I'm just wondering, what can we, is this, uh, is this percentage coming from the Vermont Health Insurance Survey? What is the underlying data and what 
can we unpack about, is it geography? Can we learn anything about geography, where people have access, where they don't? Is there anything about insurance status, type of insurance status, age? Sure. How do we unpack so, that access question there? Yeah, so this data comes from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which again is run through BDH and CDC. Um, these data that I've presented today for 2019 are publicly available because I was given permission to produce them and report them out, um, but VDH in its current state hasn't had time to produce their annual report that they typically do along with the breakfast results. And within that, you would see things like, um, you know, a lot of times for, for measures like this, it's male versus female. It's um, some of, sometimes it's insurance status included, but it does kind of vary from year to year. Um, I think once we're able to see sort of their dig at the data, I just get like a very simple Excel file with the results that I need. Um, but they also have the ability to dig into, you know, are we seeing variation by health service area? Are we seeing variation um, in other ways? And so I think um, we'll kind of have to wait until, until they're able to produce that report to get some more detail on that. Um, but while it's not while it's not trending in the direction that we would want it to, um, compared to other states, I still think we have incredibly high access. Um, so something to also keep in mind. And like I said, I'll, I'll continue to keep a pulse on where the highest performing state is. And at the time, that 89% was Massachusetts. No, that's great. I'm just thinking if we had a better understanding, if we could do a deeper dive, we might be able to identify solutions, right? How do we start to, you know, Sure. reach the folks that are not being reached right now. So and thank you. That'd be great when yeah, find that I, think, I think that's some of the analysis that we'll do. Again, it's a different data set because we'll be using sort of claims based data. But when we start to look into utilization patterns and um, in and out of the ACO type information, we'll be using, again, different data set, but can sort of do some digging into that as well once we receive some of those initial analyses from Mathematica. Great. Thanks. Okay, other board members. Yeah, I, have a, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. If you could go to slide 13. There we are. So down here in the uh, lower left-hand corner, you see the, the first asterisk that says, excludes permissible price increases relating mm -hmm. uh, to Medicaid. And I'm just wondering if we have a dollar value for those or some metric to know what they are in terms of scale for 17, 18, and 19. You know, how much, um, you know, uh, I mean, I understand the principle in the all pair model. That makes sense to me. But mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what are the numbers? Um, it, um, is the amount that is being uh, um, excluded growing or is it flatlined or is it diminishing? So I can look up the exact dollar amount after this call and send that to you. I can say that in the in 2019 it was 4.6 percent was the adjustment. And, and in, in 2018 20 it was 2.2. So that's helpful. Um, and one more kind of query. I, I sometimes don't know how to look at these quality metrics um, in these early years because so much hasn't happened um, that people hope will happen with the all payer model and the ACO. You know, for example, you know, when it comes to prediabetes, um, Vermont's benchmark plan doesn't even offer that benefit. And my hope would be that as the benchmark plan gets revisited, that um, the alignment between uh, what the blueprint provides, which is the CDC program, and uh, what is uh, the benefits that are allowed by uh, MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield will be better aligned. And <clears throat> clearly, that's a, a big part of the metric having to do with uh, diabetes in terms of the quality metrics. I would also say maybe the same thing for Fitz prospective payments, you know, in that um, in 18 and 19, you know, they were single digits and we've crept up slowly uh, to about 14 to 15% in 
2020 and 2021, um, but still aren't at a level, is my understanding, of any kind of critical mass that we really might be seeing the benefits in terms of improved quality through uh, fixed prospective payments. I mean, I think one example um, uh, that counters that is, uh, is the Southern Vermont uh, Medical Center, um, which seems to, they have a 22% uh, FPP rate, and they seem to be using that uh, freedom to uh, restructure their transitional care. So, um, I, I um, so I, I guess is it? Would you agree that you know that to that we shouldn't be taking these metrics, these uh, um, uh, 2018, 2019 metrics, too seriously? That there should be big asterisks around them because uh, they are still early in the game statistics, and um, uh, just a lot of the context and environment that we're trying to create, you know, to improve uh, healthcare quality, just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I a couple of things. Uh, first, you know, one of the main points that I made was around scale increasing between the two years. So specifically, when we're talking about that ACO population having it nearly double makes it really hard to compare things year over year. Um, that's part of the reason why in some of our other um, tables where available, we give the numerator and denominator so you could look at them in the 2018 report and see that change and that growth. Um, I would absolutely caution people making comparisons from year to year. You know, the two years is not a trend. There's a lot of volatility when we're increasing scale at this rate. Um, and in addition to that, you know, once we have a third year, which is where I'd feel a little more comfortable, our third year is 2020. Like, that's not helpful. Um, and we don't really know what that's going to look like yet. So I think there's also sort of this uncertainty of, truthfully, the ability to trend at all right in through the life of the agreement depending on what we see for 2020 and what our results start to look like um it's a fear that i have you know we have starting in year three we have to meet a, a certain threshold of achievement towards a goal for performance years one and two for quality metrics specifically we just have to be making progress and I, we've shown that we've done that in in the two years that we have data for um, but with 2020 being year three and needing to meet that threshold, um, I have some concerns about what we might see just given sort of our anecdotal understanding of reduced utilization in general. Um, and without that being coupled with potential changes in how some of these measures are actually calculated at a federal or a state level. So are they going to start including or broadening their sort of um, spec to include things like telehealth or telemedicine um, visits, whether it's phone only or not. Um, how are those types of changes gonna be made? And so until we see that play out, I, I honestly I don't have a good answer for you. I think it's it's hard. It, this is, you know, only two years. So take it with a grain of salt. I think it's, it's very promising, but at the same time, we don't know what 2020 is gonna look like. Or 2021. Thank you. So that wasn't an answer. I <laughs> okay, other board comments or questions? Uh, I just had one comment. I mean, there have been a, a lot of the questions I was looking at have already been addressed. But when we talk about um, looking forward to next year and that, um, you know, we're not expecting necessarily to see the increase we had this year, the 4.6% because of COVID, but I don't, I look at it as when, when this five years is up, which is 2022, and that's gonna be the end point, that actually might be impacted unfavorably by COVID. So how do we get ahead of that? Um, you know, because next year, right, might be low and, and I, don't, I don't necessarily look at that as improvement because of what we're doing. A lot of it may be because of just what's happening with COVID. But the year end, when it ends, right, and that's kind of what the compounded growth rate will be measured off of, could be impacted the other way. So how, how do we get ahead of that? Uh, 
Um, I think that's a really good question. I don't have the answer. We may not have an answer now, but it's something we should probably be thinking about yes. because, you know, sure, certainly next year things might come down, looks like everything's on track, but because it, it's like an end point, um, you know, and of course we, all, we keep saying things may shift, um, that could occur shifting, you know, for the 2022 year, 2021, 2022. So just something to think about. And yeah, I, th I think, oh, sorry, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to add about scale because I think scale is really a great entry point into that discussion and thinking about what proportion of the population do we have some, um, I'll use the word leverage, over and those are the populations I think where costs can be impacted in in this model per the agreement um, beyond those um, yeah I, I think it's a great question but I'm not yeah uh, it's just something we should think about yeah I think that's why you know although not required by the agreement I think that's why we've shown the growth between each year in addition to the compounded growth so that we can see that kind of movement over time as well. Um, but you're right. I mean, it might, it, it might be beneficial next year, but if, you know, by 2022, mm -hmm. that's, that's the year, that's the end point. Yeah. So, okay. Just something to think about. Thank you. No, thanks for the presentation. Other board comments or questions? If not, I'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment? Uh, Mort Wasserman. Hi, um, just wanted to make a comment about the decline in the proportion of folks with primary care and the fact that it's based on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, that is a phone-based survey system. And the CDC, and there are some really smart people doing this, has been struggling now for years with the fact that more and more people have cell phones. And so the uh, it's a random digit dialing system, but it might have trouble meeting the proportion of the population that's younger, which might actually in fact be the proportion that doesn't have primary care. It's just that this is a really tough uh, thing for survey research and I would be maybe less confident in this uh, result than in some of the others, that's all. Thank you, Mort. Next, I'm going to Walter Carpenter with Ham Davis on deck, so Walter. Hey, Kevin, I finally got on Microsoft Teams. Welcome. I can't, I can't do it through the, my main, I'm on the iPad. Uh, my question is on slide eight, the last one here. In 2019, you know, TOC, 14% of total spending on behalf of Vermont residents. I'm just curious how that was spent on behalf of Vermont residents and what it accomplished for Vermont residents. I had a couple other questions too, but the board members pretty much asked them. Um, Lindsay, you wanna take a stab at that? Yeah, um, so what I can say is that that 881 million came from the one care total cost of care 2019 annual and I've included a link in the uh, on the bottom of slide eight so you should just be able to click on that and it will take you right to the page where you can download that report that is from their redacted 2021 budget and within those documents one care does detail what per payer contracts the activities that that money was spent on. And so you can get a lot more detail from those documents than I'd be able to fit in a, a concise answer to your question. But it is all there and we did link to it, so. Okay, Ham Davis. 
can you hear me, Kevin? We can, Ham. Uh, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, the, uh, the main one is this. Can we get, can, can your data teams get a number that I, that I think is very important? Nobody else may have agreed, but that what I do with, and that is the, the, the number of Vermont residents who in the reform environment, okay, are uh, getting care under the terms of a real risk, fixed price, prospective payment system without reconciliation. That would be, I, I understand I'm, that's arbitrary, but that's, that's what I'm asking. And if so, so what we're talking about is only Medicaid. And then we're talking about the number within Medicaid that in fact is within, is, is being managed by such a, by such a, um, under such a contract, that that contract would have two aspects. One would be the fixed, the uh, prospective payment in which for the hot, for the network hospitals, there's no more money. Okay, and then there would be a second bucket where the where you where they, the the person the a, a recipient um, uh, would be able to would might get care somewhere else, and you'd have to pay for that separately on a fee for service basis. The reason for asking that is that, and 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 Kevin's asked this question now both in December and more recently, because I think that that's the one number that actually has muscle to take costs down. In other words, have prospective payments where there's no more money. Can we get a number of as of twenty, either twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, twenty one, where on a calendar basis? Which is how we work with some with the uh, with some of this stuff. We are now in the set. We're about to enter the second quarter of 2021, and so what I'm curious about is what is the best number of the p of the, the the number of people, the best number that we've had of the people that have that are being treated under under the kind of contract that is envisioned as the engine for healthcare reform in Vermont. In other words, a capitated system that is de completely departs from people of service. That's what, that's my question. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, bringing up something that has bothered me forever, in that uh, too little of a percentage of the uh, population being uh, treated is under a true. Uh, prospective payment. We know it's shadow fee for service, and uh, that just doesn't cut it. But I'll leave it to the data expert, Lindsay, to uh, try to answer your question. Well, if you can get it, Kevin, I'm buying you coffee and real coffee, not your regular stuff. <laughs> Lindsay probably can get it right now for you. I'm not sure. Can oh, you let me no. I don't want Kevin's coffee to be on the line. <laughs> um, it's okay. I I'm, I'm happy with a cheap uh, dollar McDonald's cup, as Ham knows. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I did see some numbers on that, but I don't want to misspeak uh, in this presentation. I would be much more comfortable running the numbers and giving them back to you, um, Ham. Uh, so if you would give us some time to do that, we can come up with those. I can say that it is less than the 14% um, here shown in the One Care Vermont total cost of care, um, because not all of the ACO is in a fixed perspective payment agreement. But um, I want to be true to the numbers and give you the actual results. So more to come. We'll pull that's it together nice. for you. Yeah, I mean, I, that's perfectly satisfactory to me. I would like that very much. Um, I have just one yeah. sort of a comment. I don't, I don't know that anything can be done about it, but on the quality side, I think that the medical quality is a huge, uh, difficult subject, which is, which, and I, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be overall as a system, either in Vermont or anywhere else in the United States, on being able to really measure that. But one of the things that help in Vermont is not this issue. I think that we need, I, and I understand, I've been told that it is, it is collected. We need to know the number of by hospital service area of revision surgeries. Not re the, the standard uh, metric is return to the OR or return to the hospital or readmission re or whatever you want to call it. In Vermont, if, in Vermont is small. If somebody has a, an operation that doesn't go well almost anywhere, 
they're not going to go back to the same place. They're going to go to another one. And that is the single best, in my judgment, the single best quality metric that you could look at that would actually move the needle on the care that gets delivered. Thank you. I think that was just a comment, Kev. I, I, you know. Thanks, Ham. Good points. Is there other members of the public who wish to comment at this time? Is there any other public comment? Kevin, I think uh, Richard Slusky and Eric Schulteis are raising their hands. Okay, Richard's hand just went up on mine. I still haven't seen Eric's, but I'll call on Richard and Eric will be on deck. Thanks, Kevin. Can you hear me? We can, Richard. So, well, first, I, I just want to second Ham's comment regarding the movement to prospective payment. And I just wrote a commentary on that in the digger. And I, I just think that's a key to the success of the all payer model. And I really would encourage uh, an effort to create a, a specific plan in a short period of time to accelerate that movement. So I, I'll just make that comment. Um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, and th this is, not directly related to what you've been talking about, but I, I think it's clear that there is a continuing under, undercurrent of skepticism about the all-payer model and how successful it has been among Vermonters. And my guess is if you ask Vermonters um, whether or not they know they're, they're aligned with the ACO or what benefit they're receiving, if they are aligned, uh, the, I doubt there's 5% of Vermonters that could answer that question. And, I, and so my one, I guess my concern is communication. And, and I'm not laying this necessarily at the Green Mountain Care Board, but what communication is going out to Vermonters? I mean, I, I think there are very few people that would understand what you've just presented today. And what they're seeing, what most Vermonters are seeing, is continuing increases in their health insurance, difficulty in getting appointments with doctors uh, for visits. And uh, so how, how, how do we describe the impact, the benefit of the all-payer model uh, to Vermonters in general? And I'm wondering whether any thought has been given to a communication plan in that regard. So a lot of thought has been given and a lot of effort, um, but for the most part, uh, um, without the ability for the resources to um, do things in a uh, marketing way, um, for the most part, information is available that is never accessed. Well, I think that needs to change. <laughs> Kevin, would you uh, mind if I jump in? Sure, go ahead. Um, I, I would just say I think that is would be a terrific job for uh, the Agency of Human Services, who's, and it would be, quite frankly, more appropriate to their role um, than our role as a regulator. Um, certainly, I think we've done, tried to do our best in terms of making user-friendly and consumer-friendly uh, materials available on our website, particularly around the information that we receive through the regulatory process. Um, but I think it would be great if um, others can can certainly take the lead on a communications plan. Um, certainly our transparency, I think, might help as well to the extent that people are able to tune into a regulator, which, you know, is, is a specialized interest. Uh, I'm glad we have folks like Walter and Richard who have that interest. Thank you, Robin. Eric Schulteis. Sure. Um, this is building off of, I think, what I heard um, from board member Holmes or maybe some others. Um, it would be really interesting with this to kind of think about how we can move 
or maybe we can. I mean, uh, that's the question. Move away from kind of a descriptive study, um, you know, and the targets for the APM are you have to hit X benchmark to more of a why is this occurring? Why are things going up or down? And I think that's interesting because it could potentially connect to what um, population health investments OCV is making so that as a state, we're spending money where we're at least hypothesizing that it's going to have an effect. Did I lose you, Eric? No, I, I think I'm still here. I just, that, that was it. Sorry. <laughs> I was wondering why there was silence. Um, <laughs> but I had just stopped, randomly stopped talking. Yay to Teams meetings, I suppose. That's the problem. <laughs> um, Eric, I think you made a really important point. And um, as a preview of what's to come, better understanding the, I call them the levers and the stayers of both populations over time, I hope is going to shed a little bit more light on um, the cost drivers in each of these, for each of these groups, and then um, potentially by, uh, by other factors like geography and, and age and things like that. So that's the hope. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Other I public comment? Somebody started to say something? That was me, <laughs> it was Michelle. I was just gonna say part of what we try to do in these uh, presentations and in the reports, they're, you know, dry, uh, but it is, you know, per the terms of the agreement, what we're accountable for and what we are responding to. Um, and I think a lot of these other analyses are gonna help to inform future reports. I think with only two years of data, it's a little early for us to start doing that. But as Lindsay pointed to, you know, we're, we're getting into some deeper analyses and hopefully we'll be able to expand upon them for um, 2020 and beyond. Um, but, you know, just reminding folks of what we are accountable to and, and where we are in terms of those targets that are set in the agreement. Thanks, Michelle. Is there any other public comment? Hey, Kevin. Yes, Walter. Uh, I wanna thank Richard for his comment because that's precisely what I was driving at. And we can accentuate, we can uh, add more to that, is that when you talk to the person, the average Vermonter on the streets or whatever, they have no idea what the ACO is because it has never really, it has not done anything for them. Prices still go up, uh, uninsured, co-pays and deductibles still prevent them from care. Um, <clears throat> constant problems with doctors, with claim denials, with prior authorizations, losing insurance, you know, it's the same old problem that this country has never been able to address because it doesn't, it hasn't had the will to do it yet. And Richard made some very good points about that. And that's my main concern about the ACO is we have data that goes from here to eternity and back, but you know, what's a 1.7 or 8% this or that, you know, it doesn't mean anything when somebody has got a $5,000 deductible ahead of them and needs a surgery or is uninsured and needs a surgery and doesn't qualify for any help or whatever and stuff like that. So thanks to Richard. Thank you for your comments, Walter too. I try, is there, Kevin. Is there any other public comment? Kevin, can I make one final comment? Another, another chance. This is Hans. Um, I hate to say this, but I, I, I think that you folks should just not feel too badly about about the whole issue of trying to communicate this kind of gnarly stuff to the public. I've been a professional journalist for forty years. 
and I can I, I it's my absolute judgment that the we do not not we no longer have a uh, public a, a press a press structure okay that can manage this level problem it just can't be done if somebody thinks I'd, I'd, I'd like to have somebody that knows what they're talking about tell me that that, that I'm wrong it's not, there's nothing you can do. I think it's just, it's just the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. Any other public comment? Um, this Hi. is Lindsay. I just wanted to respond um, kind of overall to a couple of comments that I heard related to all payer model impact and then the, um, how the average Vermonter feels that impact. And what I really heard, and please correct me if I misheard, was a lot of talk on affordability for the average Vermonter. And I love that line of questioning as an analyst. And so I really welcome any ideas from public comment on how we could go about measuring affordability now and in the future, any data sources you all have to recommend and other uh, and definitions as well, because as I'm sure you can imagine, it's really complicated <laughs> to talk about affordability um, to the person, to the plan, to the state. Um, so I, I love the ideas that I'm hearing. And as a member of the analytics team, I think it would be really great to pursue, but would welcome certainly the public um, perspective on affordability. So just something to think about and just know that your comment, your comments were heard. Okay. Any other public comment? Kevin, if, if I could just this Richard again, and I don't disagree with ham. I think the reason, the way people will understand the ACO is if their insurance rates stop increasing at the rate they're going, or if, if they can access care, better or if they feel they're getting service that's different than what it is today so i don't think it's about public relations i think it's about outcomes and i, I think that's what needs to occur thank you richard any other member of the public hearing none thank you lindsay and michelle a lot to digest but uh We'll keep muddling along and uh, try to meet the goals. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.